Good morning, friends. And as, we, as you have a time of worship and listening to the, the message this morning, please be assured of our continued care and love for you. And if you are in need, please do, do not hesitate to contact the office or get hold of us on our various channels. Um, and as you, you engage with the sermon for today, uh, would you read the readings either from the description below or in the worship resources that we hand out? Um, and so if you haven't done so, I encourage you to pause here and do that now. The readings today speak very clearly about foreigners and God's desire for all people to be blessed with salvation. The psalmist calls all people, all nations to praise the Lord. Isaiah speaks of foreigners being joined to the Lord. And Matthew tells us of the interaction between a Canaanite woman in a Gentile land and Jesus. And Paul to the Romans speaks of God's mercy for all. The scriptures present a question to each one of us in our context, just as the attitude of Israel and of Jesus the Jew and his Jewish disciples and the church in Rome were challenged about their attitude to outsiders, to foreigners, to Gentiles, and their social and cultural prejudice. This challenge of our social and cultural prejudice is one of significant relevance to us today. Perhaps more, to, more so during this time of the pandemic, when there are pressures on our economic well-being, uh, regulations which are preventing people from coming into uh, the country, and which may well have created stigma uh, against some foreign nationals. And there may well be an attitude of, well, uh, our nation or, or for na uh, the local nationals first. Now, South Africa is all too familiar with prejudice based on national, racial um, and cultural heritage, as well, of course, uh, based on gender. South Africa has struggled through racist policies of apartheid, xenophobia, uh, gender-based violence, amongst many other things. Systematic and individual racism is still very much present in the social fabric of South Africa and something which needs to be addressed and reformed. Likewise, there are still xenophobic attacks which crop up from time to time and many foreign nationals still experience discrimination and intimidation living in South Africa. And I recently spoke to a foreign national who shared their terrible experience of going to, to, to the hospital and being treated horribly by the staff, having to, to wait for long hours and even in the end not really receiving the care that they needed. Now I'm not too sure if this was simply because of bad service um, or their nationality, but, but they certainly expressed um, their feeling of uh, not necessarily being welcomed and, and, and just... Uh, being ill-treated by some South Africans and, and this really broke my heart and it's not I don't think it is a, 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 a unique experience of theirs as they shared but as well these things are, are not necessarily unique to South Africa alone I read an article this week about a Christian writer and, and pastor Max Licada who organized a prayer event called Pray SA um, and I thought it was Pray South Africa but it was actually Pray San Antonio but in this article, in this event, he apologized and asked for forgiveness for the past actions of white people in the United States toward black people in the recent past, as well dating back to the times of the horrific slave trade. And if you've followed any international news, then you would be familiar with the, the tension over racial lines in the United States and the movement which has uh, garnered the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And this movement also motivated a resurgence of people in South Africa expressing their experience of racial prejudice. And this was particularly pre prevalent uh, amongst the schools um, within South Africa. Now, a number of other encounters I have had this week which, which relates to our attitude toward foreigners and, and the people who are not part of our cultural or social group. And, and one of those aspects came through in the weekly letter where um, a, the church, the Zimbabwe Council of Churches, uh, issued a statement of the ill treatment of people in, in Zimbabwe and, and, and kind of the cry for help from, from other nations and, and nations from South Africa and the church to pray. The reality is that none of us are exempt from the type of thinking of being prejudiced. 
It is part of, of how we brought up being part of a specific culture and cultural and social upbringing. We speak of our heritage and we are taught a way of relating to others through that heritage and the culture. And unless we have been taught to, to listen and engage with other cultures, it seems unlikely that we will become embracing and welcoming of that which is different and foreign to what we know and experience. Even when we are open and listen, there are still prejudices within each of us that we need to constantly check and correct and seek to change. And this is especially true for the church as we hear Paul's words that God's mercy is for all people. And so we need to check ourselves that we do not get into a space of, of just keeping it close to ourselves and, and kind of saying that it's for us or for a particular group of people and exclude others. So as we look into the scripture readings, we are confronted with this all-encompassing mercy of God and our very human response to that which is different or foreign and our need to become aware of our prejudice and to have some transformation therein. As we look at the reading of Isaiah, the, the history of Israel is one where there has been a mixed relationship with foreigners. At times there were strong nationali nationalistic uh, tendencies where all other cultural influences were destroyed and shunned. At other times they embraced elements of other cultures and even religions. This was largely influenced by the people who were in power at the time, the various kings that came in and out of power. They had conflicts with many, nation, many other nations. There was even a split within Israel itself, which formed the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, between which there was often conflict. During and after the exile of some Israelites, there was also prejudice between the two groups, those who had gone and returned and those who had remained, and how they practiced their religion. Throughout their jagged history, there are dots of calls from the prophets and the law which pointed to the mercy of God being for all people and a requirement that the Jew Jews treat foreigners with respect and kindness. And of course, within the context of the Jewish faith, this embrace of God's mercy was still in a way subject to a person subscribing and being obedient to all the laws and traditions of the Jewish religion. The poem that we find in Isaiah 56 proclaims the inclusion of foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, minister to the Lord, love the name of the Lord, serve the Lord, keep the Sabbath, and hold fast to the covenant. The poem speaks of them being included in the gathering to the holy mountain, their sacrifices being accepted, and being welcomed in the house of prayer. These are all elements of being included in what the New Testament would term the kingdom of God and as being accepted as the people or the children of God. Now this history of Israel and the Jewish religion plays a part in the encounter that we read in Matthew and this continued um, idea of foreigners being accepted and trying to teach that the mercy of God goes out to all people. It is an encounter which is laden with history that has created a stigma toward the people from which the woman, who is termed a Canaanite, comes. To readers of the Hebrew Scriptures, the term Canaanite means everything dangerous to the faith of Israel. There was prejudice toward Canaanites and between Canaanites and Jews. And Jesus, of course, is born with into, into the, the Jewish culture which at the time had a very negative view of Gentiles in certain cultures, such as the Canaanites, or as well the Greco-Romans. And so up to this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has expressed that he has been called to the people of Israel first and foremost. His ministry up to this point has been within the borders of Jewish cities and towns. We are told, told that Jesus had to withdraw from the place where he was to the district of Tyre and Sidon. This was considered Gentile territory. And here Jesus is confronted by the Canaanite woman and we hear some quite harsh words of Jesus as he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as well he says, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. 
And we hear also the disciples' discomfort and prejudice in their response to the intrusion and cries of the woman as, as they request that Jesus send her away. Now this is a difficult passage to read because we can't really imagine Jesus speaking harshly to anyone or rejecting someone based on their heritage. Our gut response is to, to try and find a reason for, for Jesus' response that excuses what appears to be well, rudeness at best, or perhaps racism or xenophobia at worst. It challenges our view of the perfect Jesus, who, who always speaks kindly and embraces everyone who comes to Him. And so from this perspective, there are many who have tried to interpret Jesus' response in words in a more digestible way. Some have suggested that Jesus is using it as an opportunity to teach a lesson to the disciples. Others have tried to tame the words and by, by, by su suggesting that the word interpreted as dog was not really all that derogatory. And others still have said that it was to test the faith of the woman. Now, there are issues with each of these interpretations, and it's quite possible that all of these explanations are simply an attempt to ease our minds and our discomfort as we read them. But what if this was a genuine human response of Jesus, who took on our flesh in a very re real way, riddled with cultural biases and perhaps even prejudice? Have you considered perhaps that we need to lean into the discomfort and, and see how it forms our understanding and see what happens in terms of Jesus' response and as well the transformation that happens throughout the conversation? Several resources which I read propose that the writing suggests that this, is, this it really is a very real human response of Jesus who at first responds out of the cultural perspective in which he grew up, and then is changed during the encounter to see and embrace the woman as she displays tenacity in sticking around, countering Jesus' statements, pleading for mercy in faith, believing Jesus can help her. Some writers suggest that this was a turning point in Jesus learning a wider and clearer understanding of the will of God through experience. Jesus comes around to the Canaanite woman's point of view and recognizes the faith of the woman and that he may be wrong in his initial response and attitude. Now in considering this, there are two observations which help me in navigating this passage and Jesus' harsh words. And those are firstly that Jesus initially remains silent when the woman cries to him and secondly, it is not clear to whom Jesus directs those statements which seem to be harsh words. It is only after the disciples tell Jesus to send her away that he speaks about being called to the house of Israel and about it not being right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And Matthew tells us that, that he said these words. It doesn't say to whom he says them. And it could be almost as if Jesus initially is caught up in his thinking and is contemplating, discerning within himself about his mission and understanding of the will of God for his ministry. Having just before this preached and, and being within the Jewish towns and cities teaching, but now having to be forced or, or go away and ending up in a Gentile land. And he sort of is going, well, how does this relate um, to what I'm experiencing in this approach from the Canaanite woman? In his response, he might be speaking to himself, contemplating his cultural biases and discerning God's will in relation to the woman's intrusion and request, as well as that of the disciples' request. Through the encounter, the woman's pleas for mercy and display of faith in a counter-argument which witfully uh, disarms Jesus' harsh statements, Jesus is drawn toward her perspective and there is a change in his attitude. We then hear the words which are clearly directed to the woman, which are, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Now, there is much more that could be said about this passage in Jesus' statements and looking at the words in our investigation. 
And though we may not know precisely what Jesus meant by these statements, statement, as well as the woman may not have known, even though she responded in the way that she did, um, and, and which disarmed Jesus and brought him onto her side. But let us consider that which is before us. Let us consider our response to others as we reflect on Jesus' encounter with the foreigner, the outsider, the despised, at least by the Jewish culture. Where within us do we find prejudices? How do we treat people who are foreign to our way of being and doing? Whether that's a foreigner in terms of uh, by nation or simply whether it's a, a foreign to, to our cultural upbringing. Does there need to be a change, a repentance, a shift within our attitude, our outlook and action? Though we are born into a culture and with a certain cultural perspective, we are not bound to die with that same perspective. We ought to change. We can change. And we can do it with the real Jesus, who himself changed during this encounter with the Canaanite woman. And came around to learn a clearer and wider understanding of the will of God. Whose salvation and mercy is for all people. And so friends, let us come. Let us come to Jesus. The very real Jesus who walks alongside us as we go out into this week. And as we contemplate, as we come before God. And as well face the reality of ourselves. And know that there is forgiveness in God. Know that there is love in God and in being embraced by God's mercy. And would you continue to experience that as we worship this morning. God bless.